Martin to be here for this uh, um, session of contributed talks in equilibrium statistical mechanics. Um, so uh, we can uh, start immediately with the first speaker. Uh, um, is, uh, the first speaker is Sebastian Ott and he will uh, um, present uh, uh, his talk on of critical systems with exponentially decaying interactions. Please, Sebastian. Um, okay, so where does she? This? Yeah, that's work. Okay, so I'll talk about recent joint work with uh, Yasin Aoun, Dimitri Yoff, and Ivan Vedenik about correlation in lattice spin systems, classical lattice spin systems. So the two papers you have here are the two main sources of what I'm going to say, and what I'm going to say will be a little bit vague, that's intentional, and you can check precise statement in the paper if you're interested. So the framework is uh, classical ferromagnetic spin systems in, uh, on ZD, and well, so with, coupling, with two body interactions, so with coupli only coupling constant and no higher order couplings. So I'll suppose that the coupling are positive, so ferromagnetism, and that they are summable, normalized to have the sum equal to one. And the main example you have to have in mind is the classical easing model on ZD, which is plus one minus one spin at each site, and where the probability is formally given by the expression you can see on the slide. And moreover, I'll be mostly interested in the high temperature regime, which is, in, for the easing model, that beta is smaller than beta c, and so you have in particular exponential decay of correlation for these models as soon as the, the um, coupling constants are exponentially decaying, which is also what I'm going to restrict to. And the goal of the, the study was to study the, the behavior of the two-point function, so the point-to-point -point correlation function, and for the other model I mentioned, like the POTS model, or the XY or GFF or some models, or the easing model with a magnetic field or the lattice gas, you need to have the, instead of this two-point function, you need to consider instead the truncated two-point function. And all uh, what I'm going to say about the easing model still holds for this truncated two-point function in a uh, more general framework. So the, to study this two-point function, there is a very old heuristic that predicts the large distance behavior of the, the two-point function, which is due to Einstein and Zernike, which was proposed in the early 20th century. And basically, they have some, sort of, some list of hypotheses you can make on the two-point function. If, if the hypotheses are satisfied, then you can uh, compute, in some sense, the asymptotic behavior. So the first hypothesis is this high temperature hypothesis, which is that the two-point function decays exponentially with distance. The second uh, postulated structure is a renewal structure satisfied by the two-point function, which is this equation that you can see, which is reminiscent of what you can have for the, lat the green function or the massive green function. And this parameter rho in the einstein zernike picture is, plays the role of a density, but you for the easing model, think rho is equal to beta. And uh, the C function, which is not something that you a priori defined, which you suppose is defined by this equation, is called the direct correlation function. And it's supposed to behave on large distances like the interaction. So in particular, it should decay exponentially fast if the interaction is decaying exponentially fast. And the final hypothesis they make is that this direct correlation function decays strictly at an exponential rate strictly larger than the normal two-point function so that you have a mass gap between the direct and the correlation function and the normal two-point function. And from there, the, that's basically a theorem. If you have this list of hypotheses that are satisfied, then you can compute the behavior, the asymptotic behavior of the two-point function. And it's given by this expression and the most interesting part is really the prefactor to the exponential decay, which behaves in a universal fashion. And this is the, it's the same prefactor for a vast class of models, or expected to be the same prefactor for a vast class of models. So, and uh, what I'll be concerned with is the following point, that this picture, this Einstein-Zernike picture, 
was believed to hold in a very, very, very general setting. And as, basically, as soon as the uh, interaction is exponentially decaying, people were expecting to have the einstein zernike style behavior. And what I'll show you is that, in fact, you have to be slightly more careful than in any case. You just have to be careful when the, exp the interaction is exactly exponentially decaying. There you can have some problem. And what I will say is I'll state one theorem which will be a little bit vague, and then I'll tell you a little bit why you can expect that you should, in some situation, not have the einstein zernike style asymptotic, and a little bit on one idea on how you conduct the proof. So what did we prove is if you take the coupling constant to be well, exactly exponentially decaying, and so the exponential part is represented by this norm eta, which is a norm on Rd, and the non-exponential, the correction to this exponential is some prefactor, which is sub-exponential, then there is a condition on the prefactor such that if the prefactor fulfills the condition, you can have a regime where you don't have the mass gap hypothesis. Meaning, if you believe that the direct correlation function should on large scale behave like the interaction, you will have that the rate of decay of the, the direct correlation function is the same as the one of the, the normal two-point function. And uh, moreover, you have a failure of einstein zernike asymptotic, which is uh, the second point that you have in this theorem, which is that, in fact, the prefactor will not be dictated anymore by this uh, distance to the power d minus 1 over 2, but will be the same prefactor as the one you have in the, in the interaction. OK, so a few remarks on this. Well, the first one is what I just said, that if you, you have this summability condition. The first point is exactly the failure of the mass gap condition of einstein zernike and the second point is exactly the failure of their asymptotic, which is directly linked. A second remark is that this uh, behavior, this or failure of einstein zernike style asymptotic or einstein zernike picture is linked to a non-analyticity of the inverse correlation length of this rate of exponential decay of the two-point function as a function of beta. So the, the rate sees the fact that you're not uh, OZ because when you have this, uh, this um, ah, the two-point function decaying at the same rate as the, the interaction, in particular, the rate is constant over an interval and is non-constant over the re remaining part of the subcritical regime. And therefore, you have that the uh, inverse correlation length is non-analytic at this change of behavior point. And the uh, summability condition, to give you an idea of what it could look like, it's in particular always satisfied when you have that the prefactor of the, your interaction is summable. And one more point is what we get is slightly stronger. It's the, the, the criteria we have is really an equivalent condition to the fact that you have a regime where you have failure of mass gap. OK, so let me convince you that it's possible that you have this failure of mass gap from the einstein zernike picture. So I will suppose that I have the einstein zernike picture for the, so the, the renewal equation for the two-point function. And I'll suppose that the co direct correlation function is just the interaction. So it, it's a random walk. It's a killed random walk. So now if you look at what happens, you, uh, you want to study large-scale behavior of G and J. Also, of the two-point function G in, uh, and compare it to the large-scale behavior of the, the interaction J. And you know that the one classical fact, let's say, is that the, the behavior of the, the large-scale behavior of quantities is encoded in the Laplace transform or, of the, or, of the gen, uh, or on the generating function of those quantities. So if you look at the generating function for the interaction and for the two-point function, and that you suppose that you have the OZ equation, this gives you the, this equation for the Laplace transform. And now if you want to look at what happens, what is the behavior of the coefficient, it's studying where the, how, no, how, how does those generating function behave close to their, the boundary of the convergence domain, so close to singularities. And you can have, if you want to study the behavior of the 
g of uh, j or of the okay the generating function for the two point function you can see that you have basically two ways of having an infinite to be on the boundary of the convergence domain or to be close to a singularity either you have the the, for the one over one minus x that diverges because the uh, rho beta times j of h is equal to one so that's one way for j for g to diverge and the other way for g to diverge is just that j starts to diverge so that the singularity can come either from the uh, Laplace transform of the interaction or the singularity can come from this renewal equation, the einstein zernike equation. And our summability condition is basically a condition that ensures that it's possible that in some regime the singularity comes from the J, so the Laplace transform of the interaction and not from the, the 1 over 1 minus x singularity. And the 1 over 1 minus x singularity is exactly the singularity that gives you the einstein zernike behavior. So that's like hand-waving the heuristic behind why you can have this failure of mass gap, even if you suppose this einstein zernike picture of correlation true. And that's not exactly how we conduct the proof. The proof is based on this. If you again have, uh, you suppose that you have this einstein zernike equation, so same uh, hypothesis as before, and you iterate, you can represent the two-point function as the partition function of a certain path model. So again, it's a kill random walk, uh, all in all. And the change of behavior for the, the J, the fact that it's either einstein zernike or dictated by the interaction, it's exactly equivalent to a condensation phenomena for the path model. So the path, depending on the prefactor, will either be constituted of uh, one large edge that will cross to, from zero to x, or it will be, in which case you have the behavior of the interaction, or it's constituted of many small steps, in which case you end up with the einstein zernike asymptotic. And this path, this argument, like this uh, representation, you can have such representations for almost any statistical uh, physics model you want on lattice by generic path uh, expansion and correlation inequalities. So you can, that's really a general, uh, the way we conduct the proof is through this idea of path in, uh, in condensation for paths. And I'll stop here, so thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, there's time for one question. Yes, Daniel? Could you comment on models with continuous symmetry? Is it possible to do something? And is there something related to Kostelitz Tauless? Well, in the, in the regime we are, so it, uh, the main supposition that you have to make is the exponential decay of the two-point function, which in particular says that you're in a high temperature regime so you don't see the, the fact that you have like costelitz Tauless or anything. You're in a regime where all models are the same, basically. Okay, thank you, thank you again. And uh, uh, we can move to the next talk uh, by Peter Madsen. Um, uh, he will present uh, uh, his results on classical density functional theory with short-range interactions and local density approximation. Please. Thank you. Okay. First off, to uh, all the people who actually showed up, both on site and online, I want to thank you for showing up, and uh, to the organizers, thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to uh, briefly talk to you about a uh, project that I've been working on for the past year with my uh, <coughs> uh, colleagues, Mathieu Levine and uh, Mich Michael Jex, uh, about the local density approximation for classical uh, density functional theory with short range, uh, short range interactions. Um, and um, this is a pretty recent result. We, uh, we only finished the proof of our main result two days ago at this conference. So it's uh, fresh out of the oven. Um, first off, I've, I'm just gonna tell you very shortly about the setting of uh, classical density functional theory 
I'm going to talk to you a little bit about thermodynamic limits. And finally, I'm going to uh, explain our result. Um, and I'll not be proving anything. So, we start out at the beginning. Uh, we consider a system of uh, classical identical particles in some domain, lambda in, uh, in d dimensions, um, with some external potential v, and uh, the particles interact through a, a pair potential w. Um, in uh, the grand canonical ensemble, the, uh, the minimal free energy at uh, inverse temperature beta is uh, minus 1 over beta log the partition function. Um, the partition function is, uh, is this guy here. This is the first thing you, uh, you learn about statistical mechanics. Um, variationally, you can uh, compute this thing by minimizing over the set of all grand canonical states. These are uh, families of um, n-particle canonical states, which are This thing is weird. Okay, so the, the end particle canonical states are just uh, symmetric uh, measures on, uh, on lambda n, and the entire family is uh, normalized in this way such that the family P is, uh, is a grand canonical measure, prob probability measure. Okay, so you minimize the energy of these states. Uh, this gives you the, the minimal energy, uh, but you, you can also do it in two steps by first saying we, we fix the, uh, the density of the state rho, minimize over all states with, uh, with density rho, and then afterwards minimize over all densities rho. If your state has density rho, then the, uh, the contribution from the external potential is just the integral v times rho. Um, so we pull that out of the uh, thing, and the thing I've highlighted in blue is uh, the minimal energy of the grand canonical system at fixed density rho. And this is really the, uh, the object you want to study in classical density functional theory. Okay. But just uh, for the sake of completeness, uh, the density of a uh, grand canonical state, this is just the sum of all the marginal densities. And of course, you can do the same thing in the, in the canonical ensemble. Um, Our main result only concerns the, uh, mainly concerns the grand canonical ensemble, uh, which is uh, normally easier to work with. Okay. Um, let me just briefly mention that um, you can also attack this problem um, through the inverse problem, um, namely if, if you can find some potential v such that this expression on, on the right hand side gives you your fixed density rho, um, then, uh, I mean, th th this thing is really just the, uh, the one particle density of the corresponding Gibbs state at p uh, with uh, external potential v. Then you get this, in, uh, this equality here. Your um, minimal energy at uh, density rho can be computed by, um, as the, uh, the energy of the corresponding Gibbs state minus integral v rho. So you, you, you have a, this sort of duality. Um, there, there are a lot of works on uh, existence and uh, uniqueness of, uh, of these um, inverse, po uh, these potentials v for the inverse problem. Um, the the <coughs> usual reference is Shai Shai's leap from uh, 94, but you also have uh, a more recent result by uh, Janssen, Kuna, and uh, Zakharo Giannis, uh, which was presented uh, yesterday here at this conference. They, um, they, they succeeded in, in uh, com computing, actually yeah, showing existence and, and computing the, uh, the, the inverse potential V for um, any density row which is uniformly small enough. Also in the, in the case of the 1D hardcore uh, system, you, we, we have an explicit solution by Perkins by all, all the way back from uh, 96. Okay, so 
the, um, the interaction potentials, W, that we consider. They look like this. Um, it's an even function on, uh, on RD, which can be uh, written as a sum of W1 plus W1 and W2. W1 is uh, non-negative and W2 is stable, um, which means there's a, uh, a constant C such that the energy of any configuration um, is bounded below by minus C times the number of particles in the configuration. Okay. And if um, we furthermore require that uh, W1 is strictly positive around the origin, then our in in entire interaction W is uh, what is called superstable. Okay. And we are going to assume this. I didn't write it explicitly, but uh, Um, we assume that uh, W around the, uh, the origin increases uh, like a negative power of, um, of X. Um, and at infinity, we assume that uh, it decays like 1 over, S, uh, 1 over X to the S for, for some um, uh, S which is larger than, than the dimension. So. Uh, this makes uh, W integrable at infinity. Okay. Um, I think I might have uh, written in my abstract that we also consider hardcore um, interactions. This is not really the case yet. I, I mean, this growth rate is, is strictly less than infinity. Um, and this is because we, st we, strictly speaking, have not proved our result uh, for the uh, hardcore gas yet, but, but we are getting there. Um, it's only a matter of time and technicalities. Okay, so uh, let me just briefly mention that in, uh, in the usual case where you don't fix the position de uh, densities of, uh, of your system, the, um, the usual thermodynamic limit exists. This is well known, has been known for, uh, for decades. Uh, and I'm, I'm highlighting in particular the, uh, the canonical case that's uh, going to show up on the next slide. <clears throat> okay, so um, with interactions like this, uh, we can prove, just as, a, as an appetizer, uh, the thermodynamic limit in the canonical ensemble at fixed flat densities. It exists. And in the limit, we, we get the same thing as we do in the usual case, where we don't fix the... Uh, the density of the system. As an easy corollary to, to this, we also get the same thing in the grand canonical case. Okay, <clears throat> so um, now we have a notion of um, energy per unit volume of, of an infinite system, an infinite uniform system. So uh, we can move on to the, um, the local density approximation, which looks like this. You give me a density and uh, ask me to compute the, uh, the minimal energy at this density, and I say, uh, what, what if we just locally uh, replace the energy by the energy of a uniform system with density rho of x, and integrate it? We want to make an approximation like this, and we ask, in, to which extent is this a good approximation? Um, and now, um, since two days ago, we, we have a, an answer to this question, at least partially. And it lo looks like this. So we take some m, and we consider only densities that are uh, bounded by this m. Okay. And we take some power p, which is uh, larger than the dimension. Then there is a constant, c, which depends on m, and it depends on the interaction, such that the distance between these two expressions it's uh, is bounded by this thing. Okay, so you uh, you have the mass of the densi density, the uh, the integral of the, the square root showing up, and then you have this gradient correction, which is really bad uh, because the uh, the power of epsilon here is negative, so it's typically I mean, big bigger than the others. But uh, the, the, this uh, is a result we get for any density without assuming anything about the the flatness of, uh, of rho. So you, 
Um, but it's really only useful if rho is, ve if, if rho is very flat. So uh, you, you, you want the, the integral of the gradient of rho to the power p to be of much lower order than the mass. <coughs> okay. Um, this constant c, it's... Um, it's um, essentially explicit from, from our proof, but uh, it's very ugly and complicated, and uh, it behaves very badly with, uh, with this m and, uh, and also with the, uh, the growth rate of, um, of the potential around the, uh, the origin. Um, yeah. And then as a, as a final remark, uh, it's a bit arbitrary that the square root of, root of rho shows up in, in the bound. Really, we, we can replace it by a rho to any power which is between 0 and 1, or even uh, something like rho times log rho to some appropriate power. And this, uh, we just chose an explicit thing for the sake of exposition. <coughs> so... Um, Quantitative results like this on uh, the, the validity of a, uh, local density approximations are so far a little bit sparse in the, the lit literature. Um, is, uh, at least if you, if you look at uh, mathematically uh, rigorous results. I only know uh, three other references. Um, the first one is uh, by Levine Deep Seyinger. They, uh, they consider the um, canonical uniform electron gas um, Coulomb interaction in, in three dimensions. And uh, they managed somewhere to, uh, to prove that if you take a density and scale it appropriately, so um, it becomes very flat in the limit, then in the limit, uh, the, the, le um, the leading order of, uh, of the in energy uh, goes to, to uh, the corresponding expression in, in, in that case. Um, this is at uh, zero, zero temperature. Um, so you, you get something like energy of the uniform electron gas and then integral rho to four thirds or something like that. And um, then you have some, some results in the quantum case, also 3D with Coulomb interaction um, afterwards, uh, quickly afterwards, uh, an extension by uh, Nico Meech to a class of uh, very smooth um, short range interactions. Uh, Common for all of these three papers is that they uh, rely on um, the graf schenker inequality to uh, to provide a lower bound for the um, the energy here. Um, we we use some uh, some nice trick with um, equivalence of ensembles in the thermodynamic limit to uh, to avoid this. Okay. So uh, that's our result. I had maybe planned on uh, teasing you a little bit about wh what ingredients we use in the proof, but for the sake of trying to stay on schedule, I think we'll just skip this and I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Ah. Uh, yes, there are a couple online. Um, okay, one, uh, 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 yes, uh, could you remind us of the precise definition of uh, uh, F grand canonical uh, uh, beta rho? And was it in terms of a Legendre transform? F grand canonical beta rho. No, it's really just a, it's really just a, uh, in terms of a minimization problem. The, the thing in blue here. So it's, it, it's just the minimum of the energy um, over all grand canonical states with one body density exactly equal to rho. Okay, where, where rho here is a number. No, rho here is a function. It's a profile. It's a pro density profile. Ah, okay. Yes. Okay, so uh, I, I also had the question. So in, in, the, in the final result, uh, the rho of x uh, that appears uh, in the right side uh, is the same profile as the rho in the left side. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, in the two 
terms of the yes so um, uh, so row here in, in the result is really a density profile okay thanks other questions okay if not thanks uh, the speaker again thank you and uh, we can proceed with the next one uh, um, uh, this is uh, online. I think all the next speakers are uh, online. To follow, we have a presentation from uh, uh, Peter Mühlbacher uh, uh, on dimerization in quantum spin chains uh, with uh, ON symmetry. Okay. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, so uh, today I want to talk about demerization quantum spin chains with um, ON symmetry. This is uh, joint work with Jakob Bjornberg, uh, Bruno Nachtegall, and my supervisor Daniel Ulci. So um, let's break down the, the title first. Um, so, so we have a quantum spin chain with some big um, half integer spin s. Um, so that means that the state space will be obtained by attaching to each um, site X, some copy of local Hilbert space C to the N, where N is given by 2S plus one. And the ON symmetry, this just means that our Hamiltonian uh, that acts in the state space should commute with um, every orthogonal operator. Um, now geometry enters the picture um, by prescribing our Hamiltonian to look, to look like this. So um, this means that we have some, some nearest neighbor interactions. The, these um, H um, operators here, um, so H, X, X plus one, really um, acts on a, a pair of adjacent sites, X and X plus one in, in our graph here. Um, and now if we furthermore uh, assume translation invariance, so that all these um, H's here are really just copies of the same operator, but acting on uh, different parts of the tensor product, so acting on different sites, uh, then we end up with essentially a two-parameter family. So concretely, um, there exists some real valued constants U and B, such that every single such H uh, can be written as a linear combination of uh, some transposition operator, um, which really just swaps the, um, the spins at two adjacent sites and some projection operator. But the exact form is not uh, too important. So, okay. So I hope this um, justifies um, considering Hamiltonians of this form. And now you will notice that I set V equal to one. Um, I can do this without loss of generality because we're interested in, in the ground state. So if we define states in the usual way, and we send beta to infinity, then it's not hard to see that all that matters is actually the ratio of u to v. So that's why we can set v to one. Um, now, our main result is that for large spins and small u, um, so sufficiently large, sufficiently small, um, we have some observable, some local observable that is banded away from uh, zero uniformly in system size and um, its sign depends on the parity um, of the system size L. So, um, okay, so I can give you R explicitly, but it's not too important. Um, so what I want you to, to think of this is uh, the following. In the grand state, the system likes to uh, place as many dimers, whatever that may be, as possible. So if you're um, in this, uh, so if, if, you're, if you're L equals two, that means we consider these four sites here, um, then you know, we, we can place two dimers, at most two dimers. And in some sense, R is supposed to measure this correlation. So it is zero is more likely to be connected in some sense to minus one. Um, and you see if L is even, um, then we have this inequality. So zero is more likely to be connected to minus one. If L is odd, then zero is more likely to be connected to plus one. Um, the methods we use to prove this kind of result are actually quite robust. So 
uh, we can also prove that the Hamiltonian has a positive spectral gap uniform in um, system size spins and, uh, and this perturbation U. And we can also prove uh, exponential decay of spin-spin correlations. So this is really a lot more interesting than just, uh, say, easing anti-ferromagnet ground state, where you could also have see some sort of dimus, but everybody definitely have long range correlations. Okay, so why should you care about this model and, and in particular this result? So uh, I think it's interesting because the, this ON symmetry, so we end up at least in the grand state with effectively this one parameter family here. And none of these results that I just mentioned are really a feature of this, this ON symmetry. So you see that um, there are very solvable cases expected to be here. So we have some matrix product state. We have some uh, Vesutikin uh, point here. Um, Dimers are not expected to be everywhere. So we expect them to be on, on this arc. Uh, what we can do is prove that they are around a point where u equals zero. Um, this point is actually also quite well studied. So. Uh, fairly recently, Eisenman, Dominique Copin, and Vatel proved um, dimerization, um, but also for lower spins. We proved dimerization for high spins, uh, but um, well, but at least we can put up around it. Um, and also, long range, so exponential decay of correlation is, is not something that you should expect to, to have anywhere, and that you should not expect it to be. Um, well, to, 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 to persist after perturbing your system a bit, like, I don't know, if you're here, you can't really go here without losing the, the exponential decay of correlations if, if you have it. Okay. So, um, what is, uh, and I want to, to give you some very rough idea why, um, why this works. So the key ingredient here is really this probabilistic representation, which is kind of Feynman cuts like, uh, which was pioneered in the nineties and um, then extended by uh, agenda well, somewhat recently. And the idea is to uh, take your original graph here. So in our case, it's some linear graph attached to each edge, some imaginary time interval of height beta. Beta is the inverse temperature and now place some of these double bars and crosses according to what is essentially a Poisson point process of unit intensity. Now, once you obtain such a configuration of, um, of crosses and double bars, you weigh each such configuration by u to the number of crosses times n to the number of loops minus the number of double bars. So I didn't tell you what a loop is. So imagine you start at this point here. Now you decide to go upwards. When you encounter a cross, you traverse the cross, continue going in the same, in the same direction. If you encounter the end of this imaginary time interval, you make use of periodic time, uh, time boundary conditions. If you encounter a double bar, you traverse it, but you change directions and so on and so forth. So here you end up with one loop. Um, another loop would be this one here or a quite a pretty short one here. Okay, so, so this way you can get the number of loops. Um, now, how does this relate to uh, what I was actually talking about before? So this operator R that is supposed to measure some sort of correlation um, can be expressed as the measure of the configurations where, oops, uh, where X is um, connected to Y. So that means it's, it's in the same loop. Now, somewhat suggestively brought here P for like suggesting it might be a probability measure, but actually this is a signed measure for negative U. So this makes the analysis quite complicated. Um, so how do we get around this? The, the key idea is to perturb around optimal configurations. So optimal configurations are essentially an uncountable set um, of configurations that um, in some sense maximize th these weights here. You see, if we want to maximize this for large n and small u, you don't want to place lots of crosses because this makes this contribution very small. Um, and one way to get lots of loops is to just 
place lots of um, double bars on top of each other. And um, so for each double bar, you create one loop. And, um, and this is looking pretty good. However, if you place um, a double bar between such nice columns, which are in some sense corresponding to these timers, um, then you actually decrease the number of loops per one because you merge two loops here. Um, but you also increase the number of um, double bars. So this co really costs you a factor of one over n squared, which is pretty bad. So we can encode these long loops. These are loops like this thing here as excitations of some contour model and then um, use some, the, the cluster expansion to perturb around this um, uncountable set of optimal configurations. Um, the necessary conditions to actually apply this relatively well-established technique are very hard to prove, however, and this is uh, what really is, takes up the most space in, in our paper. Okay, and that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, any question from the on-site audience? Okay, uh, I have one. So um, uh, your, your result holds for, uh, for a spin sufficiently large, but uh, what is at least the conjecture, uh, the, the conjecture for the, the, the optimal uh, uh, spin above which the, the demyerization right. picture should hold? So at least at this point, I think this um, paper mentioned by Eisenman Dimitri Vatsal showed that it should hold, we have, we should expect memorization for S bigger or equal than one, I think. Um, okay. It's not obvious to me if it's that easy to, but, but I guess, I, okay, it's, it's a pretty bold guess, but I, I would assume that maybe, maybe even after this, it is possible to actually also put out around it. Um, I'm not sure, if, but I mean, this is where I think where we should expect dimers. Um, whether we expect this for dimers also for, s for small spins, I'm not exactly sure. Maybe, um, but, uh, but I don't want to make too, too bold a prediction here. No, but I guess you could have uh, uh, a relatively small spin and then uh, much smaller U, I guess. Um? In principle, you could have uh, just a fixed uh, spin, uh, I don't know, two, and then very small U. Yeah. Is there any hope that you um, can generalize, uh, or, 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 or this is outside the range uh, of validity? Uh, for, well, I, I don't think it is possible with um, the way we set up the cluster expansion. Um, obviously, I won't make any claims about whether people of uh, new ideas can, can do something more. Um, but uh, for, for the cluster expansion, you, you definitely need uh, like, uh, well, at, at least we need pretty large and to, to, to make it work. Um, so I think, I think the, the point is that in order to have these timers here, you really want some very strong force um, to, to, you know, kind of really force your system to place lots of these double bars on top of each other. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for, for um, if, if N is not, pretty large, then I, I feel like there is also this, this kind of entro well, entropy in this probabilistic sense that a personal point process will occasionally post some, some, some double bars in between and hence kind of destroy these, these timers. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. So it's at least our method, I think, didn't work for it. Any additional comment or question? Okay, if not, let's Thank the speaker again. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is uh, uh, Flora Kukiu, um, presenting a uh, um, talk on freezing at no low temperature entropy in the Gaussian models. Please, you can start. Thank you. Uh, let me first help the organizers for giving the opportunity to present uh, uh, some new results concerning uh, the relation between freezing and low temperature 
for um, uh, in, uh, the low temperature entropy in uh, some um, Gaussian um, uh, mean field models. Let me start by recalling the uh, definition of freezing. A freezing can be either defined from the behavior of the free energy for low temperature, for, uh, that means uh, for temperature um, bigger than uh, f uh, some, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, lower some uh, specific uh, uh, temperature called, called freezing temperature, or from the concentration of the Gibbs measures on local extremes values on the random fields. The freezing property uh, has investigated for the first time in the REM model, and then uh, has attracted very, very uh, um, um, interest in, in the science, uh, uh, in mathematics and physics, especially recently in the case of extreme value statistics, aiming at uh, precisely describing the fluctuations around the mean value of the free energy. Here, I'm asking another question, uh, whether it's possible to relate freezing with the entropy of the Gibbs, of a Gibbs measure. Indeed, we can see in the following that it is possible to define the equivalently freezing by the vanishing of the entropy for a class of the Gibbs measure, for a class of uh, mean field models, I'm going to define it in the following manner. I can continue here. So this is a scheme. Uh, can, it can be used to define several um, um, Gaussian mean field models uh, widely studied uh, from physicists. It uh, presents the scheme. It's just a uniform, uh, unified scheme. It's very easy. We start um, with finite alphabet. Here I have only two letters. Uh, think about a plus or minus one instead of uh, A and B. And you consider words of length N. The word will be the configuration. For its word, you, associate, uh, you, find, you define the random Hamiltonian. The explicit form of the Hamiltonian depends on the specific model. For instance, if you consider the random energy model, you can define um, a family of IID, IID Gaussian random energies, J A alpha, where the alpha or the configuration is a word given by the end, the end of of the nth uh, level, the nodes of the nth level. In the case of multiplicative chaos of the uh, polymers of the trees, uh, you can define the Hamiltonian of the model uh, uh, with, uh, by making use this um, um, Gaussian IID random weights, uh, which are indexed by the edges. We can also use this framework, framework to define um, the um, certain Patrick mean field um, uh, spin glass model, where here I'm writing a Hamiltonian. Uh, this is the original definition of the Sheraton Patrick model, uh, where the J's, the interaction J's, are family of IAB centered Gauss random interaction indexed by the pairs of levels. I had noted here some pairs of pair levels, and uh, the Hamiltonian read, uh, uh, written in red corresponds to uh, the configuration alpha, A, uh, A, B, A, A, uh, corresponding to a, a sector battery model with four sides. Uh, as usual, for uh, its uh, inverse temperature beta positive, uh, the partition function is defined as a sum over the words, over the configurations of the random weights. Here, I uh, use this normalization of the um, Boltzmann factor for um, calculation regions. This, uh, this will be clear later why I have used this uh, normalization. And the Gibbs measure is defined as usual by the, uh, this expression, this equation. 
Uh, I'm recalling the thermodynamic quantities of the model, the annealed free energy, the quench free energy. I'm using the letter G instead of F because of the normalization I have introduced before, and the entropy by this expression. All of these thermodynamic quantities uh, have uh, um, a limit um, uh, non atom at the thermodynamic. Uh, at S L goes to infinity. And I recall in here, I'm recalling here from the variation of the relation of the free energy with the entropy, which this relation will be useful for the, um, uh, for the following um, proof. So the critical behavior of uh, all the models is characterized by critical temperature uh, at which, from, beyond which the counts and the annealed free energy differ. And I'm defined here the freezing temperature as the minimum of beta at which the entropy vanishes. I'm summarized the result for the four previously defined models in this theorem, assuming the differentiability of the free energy with respect to the inverse temperature the freezing temperature of the Gaussian mean field models previously defined cannot exceed the value beta star given by this uh, but four times logarithms of two. Moreover, for every beta bigger or equal to beta star, big, that means bigger from the, uh, uh, than the freezing temperature, the specific entropy vanishes at the thermodynamic limit. Let me note that I put this, this assumption of the differentiality here only for the case of the Shakespeare antipatric model in the low temperature case uh, region. Uh, all models uh, ha have the free energy, the, the quench free energy is differ differentiable. Also, the free energy uh, of the uh, serotonin hematic model at high temperature, but for the low temperature, there is no, not yet firm uh, proof. Of course, uh, we expect that the free energy of the serotonin hematic model is also differentiable at low temperatures, but up to now, we have no uh, complete proof. So I prefer to put this uh, assumption here. And moreover, um, and we have uh, that for all models are frozen uh, for all beta uh, bigger than beta star, which is the freezing temperature. But for the random energy model, for the random polymers and the multiplicated chaos, uh, the freezing temperature coincides with the critical one. And moreover, the um, entropy is zero. In the case of Shelton Kipatic, we know that the critical entropy is one, the critical, sorry, the, the critical temperature is one, the value of critical temperature is one. The entropy is non-zero at this temperature, and the freezing temperature for the SK model is bigger than the critical one. So how, some ideas of the proof, how or I can prove this result. So before giving the idea of the proof I prefer, it's, it's better to uh, show you from where comes the value, this specific value beta star of the freezing temperature. In this uh, graph, in this um, uh, picture, I'm giving the graph of the quench free energy of the shared occupatic model. Um, this is the blue line, the quench free energy. The annealed free energy is completely, uh, is, is, is easily calculated. So it's given by the blue line. Beta one is the critical um, point. And the normalization uh, we have used uh, for the Boltzmann factors allow to have this graph like this, having this minimum, its minimum at this point A, at the uh, critical temperature, 
And then oh, if you draw a straight line starting from zero, passing from the point N, this line crosses the annealed uh, free energy at a point A prime corresponding to beta star. This is the definition of the beta star. Now, the real, the, the, the quench free energy for beta, bigger than beta one uh, for low temperature, lies in this region. Why? Above the dashed line, because from the convexity, just by convexity, and below the blue line by the concavity logarithm. So the quench, the, the, the quench free energy of the model crosses the, the segment at a point called C prime. Now, the idea of the proof. The idea of the proof comes from this equation. At the point Vita star, which defines the, as we can see later, the freezing temperature, temperature, the annealed free energy is expressed uh, as a function of the annealed or the quench for the beta one, because we have a quality of the beta one, by this equation. This equation is the starting point of the proof because it is now intuitively appealing to accept, to expect some relation between the Gibbs measures at uh, the um, uh, temperatures beta star and beta one. And indeed, this, this is a case. Namely, we can show that this relation this connection between the Gibbs measure uh, uh, is given by the relative entropy of the measure at beta one with respect to the measure at beta star. In particular, what we can um, show using convex analysis arguments, we can show that the, at beta star, the segment, this segment is given C, C prime, corresponds to the relative entropy, and we can estimate this. Once we, this estimation of the, the relative entropy is consistent only with the value zero of the entropy. This is, so I repeat here, this is the idea of the proof. It's not extremely difficult, it's tedious, but the idea comes from uh, this equation, and then how to estimate the relative entropy of the Gibbs measure of the uh, of the uh, of the measure of, uh, of at beta one with respect to the measure at beta star. So what we have got now with this um, that the entropy vanishes beyond beta star. So it was uh, um, the entropy. It's a zero for beta bigger than beta star remains zero. Of course, uh, we have uh, obtained lower bounds for the ground state energy, and more importantly, we establish uh, the behavior of the low temperature of the free energy of the SK, and this is summarized in this um, picture. So uh, I summarize everything here. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. The blue line from zero to beta one, beta one take beta one e equals to one because it corresponds to the critical temperature of uh, the SK model, uh, the quenched and uh, free energy coincide. From beta bigger than beta one, uh, the free energy, the quenched free energy lies in the blue region. The annealed free energy is the given by the red curve. So this blue region is characterized, the, the lower boundary of the blue region is given by the results of this work I have just presented, and the upper boundary of the, the blue region is given by the spherical model. Now, this approach 
can also be used to, to uh, study the freezing property in connection with the behavior of the multifractalic spectrum of uh, local related Gaussian fields, not only for, uh, for these models. Why? Because so the entropy, once you can prove the vanishing of the entropy, you can in differently in, in an um, the equivalent formulation to show that the Hausdorff dimension of the support of the uh, Gibbs measure is zero. So, and then you can also uh, estimate the um, multifractal or the fractal uh, character of the spectrum. Another uh, possibility is to use uh, uh, these uh, uh, expressions uh, you, uh, um, involving the relative entropy uh, in um, uh, some problems arising in um, a signal process um, um, uh, setting. Namely, uh, we, if uh, you can um, consider uh, Gibbs weighted trees, and if you do some uh, uh, random some sparsing, uh, sparse, you can um, uh, sampling, you can uh, reconstruct some initial me measure uh, via the study of the relative entropy uh, given by this. Just this, uh, this is the prototype to um, recover the behavior of the measure uh, thanks to the calculation of, uh, to, to, of the relative entropy. So I have, I think my time is over. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, time for one question. Yes. So you mentioned the condition on the differentiability of the free energy. Yes. Are you confident it's true? Uh, yeah, so, uh, so for all models, uh, is um, for, uh, you mean for the for the cell to battery model? So everybody, so everybody expects this, and uh, for the high temperature, uh, there is no problem. For the high, for the low temperature, so nobody believes that is not true. But I have not seen any film proof. And so would it be worth also exploring? What would happen, assuming the opposite? I mean, but there would be. No, no, no. Uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm saying that the, the, uh, the, uh, I, 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 I guess I believe also that the, the free energy is differentiable for our temperature, but uh, I have not seen any proof. But if it is differentiable, it, it lies here. And the, low the lower bound is, is uh, given by this, the lower boundary, but because, because of the, you know, once you have proof, proven that the entropy is zero, the, the tangent here from, uh, goes from, uh, pass, passes from zero. So it's, it's just from a, a simple convexity argument from variational principle, you cannot go far, uh, lower than this bound. The only thing concerning the result, it is possible because uh, uh, the proof uh, uh, gives a lower bound of the, uh, of the relative entropy. It's, it is possible to have reached the vanishing from the entropy slightly before beta star. But the results are not still so. The, in any case, the uh, quench free energy is bigger than this bound and of course strictly lower than the above boundary because of the um, spherical uh, model uh, boundary. Okay. But we have to, uh, we need the differentiability and so I, I don't believe that it, it is not uh, differentiable and the other results also um, uh, consider Paris uh, solution that everybody believes that it is differentiable at low temperature, but uh, there is no film um, and I think I, a complete proof. Yes. No, uh, I think we, we should continue. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, thanks again. Thank you. And uh, um, we have the last speaker of today's session uh, is uh, Stephen Diaz uh, Barreto. Uh, he will tell us about the uniqueness of equilibrium state of a quantum spin system on a graph.
Hello, good evening. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Please. Uh, good evening, can and uh, I, we can hear you. Uh, yes. Uh, we can start pre the presentation. Yes. Good evening, and uh, uh, let me begin by thanking the organizers for this opportunity to speak at this congress. So no. the title of my talk Wait, is. Uh, we don't. We don't see the presentation in this moment. Uh, just a minute. Are, are you sharing your screen? Just let me check. Share this. Now, can you see it? Uh, we yes. start to see something, not yet. Oh, okay. Now we see. Yes. Okay. Thank Please. you. Sorry for the inconvenience. So, uh, good evening, and uh, let me begin by thanking the organizers for this opportunity to speak at this Congress. The title of my talk is Uniqueness of the Equilibrium State for a Quantum Spin System on, on the Infinite Graph. Well, the motivation for this talk uh, basically comes from spin, quantum spin glasses. As you know, traditionally, quantum spin glasses have been studied as systems of spins located on a lattice interacting randomly. Well, an alternate model for this kind of system can be based on the realization that the magnetic ions located on the lattice sites are randomly distributed. And in some sense, this gives us the structure of a graph embedded on a lattice. So instead of considering that, uh, spins located on a lattice with random interactions, we could consider the spins to be located on a graph with countable number of vertices with deterministic interaction. And so in a way, we can caricature a quantum spin glass as a quantum spin system with spins located on a graph with countable number of vertices with deterministic interaction. Well, the, this study of mine is, is basically restricted to nearest neighbor type of interaction. And what I really mean by this will be explained shortly. So the, so when I say, uh, so when I say that you know that interaction in this model is it is finite range, what I really mean is that the interaction is non-zero if and only if two vertices are connected by an edge, and otherwise they are zero. I make the essential assumption in this case that the degree of any vertex here is no more than alpha, and since interactions are uh, short range and deterministic. If you have a set anything other than a simplex, the interaction will vanish. So what do I really mean by a simplex? Before that, I would just like to mention that the main results, result is the uniqueness of the equilibrium state for this model for all temperatures beta. So in order to get going, we, have, we put a definition in place. The graph we assume is simple. If there's no loops or multiple edges. And we assume that there's a fixed valency alpha, in other words, you do not have more than alpha edges incident on any vertex or any vertex V. A non-empty set of this vertex will be a simplex of the graph if given any two vertices of the, of the set S there exists an edge between the two. Is an N simplex if it has N plus one element. Now, it's not very difficult to see that a simple graph, by this I mean that there's no loops or no multiple edges with finite valency. And by this I mean that there are no more than alpha, alpha vert vertices instant with a given vertex. There will be no simplex for n greater than alpha. And there are therefore at most two raised to alpha simplexes containing any vertex V. So let me describe the model in brief. So we start off with a quantum spin system with spins located on the vertices of a 
uh, infinite connected graph. The vertex set is countably infinite. E denotes a collection of edges. The graph is assumed to be simple and has finite valency alpha. And by a connected graph, I mean that there's a path between any two vertices of edges. A quantum spin is assumed to be located in each of these vertices, and two spins interact with a connected by an edge. Otherwise, they do not interact. The typical observable algebra is a UHF algebra constructed of all finite subsets of this finite subsets of this vertex set V in a typical fashion, where for any fixed lambda, where lambda is finite, the Hilbert space associated with this lambda, the tensor product of Hilbert space at each vertex V, which I assume is two-dimensional over the complex field C. And then uh, the observable algebra, local observable algebra at each lambda is nothing but the set of all bounded linear operators on this H lambda. And then using the tensor product properties, I construct an inductive limit of these small subalgebras over all finite subsets of V. And we end up with this big algebra A, which is the observable algebra for the infinite system. So this is a typical construction, the case of a quantum spin system on an on infinite set. Now, it is, it, it's, it's, it's easily seen that if two sets are sufficiently far away, in other words, the intersection is empty, then the two observable algebras could commute. And we will use this property to construct the dynamics of the, of the system in the slides to follow. In order to construct the dynamics, we need to define the type of interaction we're going to be dealing with. So for me, an interaction is a function from a collection F of finite subsets X of this vertex set V into the Hermitian elements in the uh, UHF algebra A, such that for every finite set X, phi X is an element of AX. So AX is nothing but the set of all bounded linear operators on H of X, where H of X is the tensor product of of a uh, small h of x for all elements in the capital X. And we say the interaction is nearest neighbor type if phi of x is equal to zero whenever x is not a simplex of the graph. And let me remind you again, by, by, by the term simplex, I mean that every pair of elements in this set should be connected by an edge. And since the valency is at most alpha, of the graph is at most alpha, we, we do not expect a simplex of order greater than alpha. In other words, a simplex with more than alpha plus one element. Now for a finite x, phi x represents the interaction energy of the spins confined to the set x, and hence the total energy for a finite lambda containing v consists of some of these phi x. This is the total energy of the Hamiltonian in each lambda, and this we take as the, as the Hamiltonian of our system. Very clear that h is Self-adjoint self element of A lambda. Now, now that we put defined the interactions, we can. It is time to talk about time the evolution of the system. So in order to study the evolution of the finite system, we first write down the equation concerning a finite lambda. So, typically, this equation results in this solution, which gives rise to a automorphism group of A lambda. The idea is to let lambda evolve so that it fills up the whole set V and then look at the evolution of A as an element of the, the, the larger C cyst algebra A. So if you want to, if you want to compute the, the limit of tau lambda tends to infinity, we need to, we need to take the limit of tau tilde lambda, lambda tends to infinity. Now, as you can see, uh, when we say lambda tends to infinity, what we really mean is lambda eventually contains all finite subsets of V, okay? So by this, we mean that given an epsilon, there exists a finite set such that S lambda minus S can be made smaller than epsilon whenever lambda contains lambda there. So basically, this is convergence in the net sense. But this is equivalent to a quotient notion of convergence for nets. 
So given an epsilon, there is a finite set such that S lambda 1 minus S lambda 2 is less than epsilon whenever lambda 1 and lambda 2 contain lambda prime. So in order to construct the global dynamics, we start off with the local dynamics, tau t lambda, which is given by this expression. And these are your odd nth order commutators, which are defined as follows. So to, so to prove the dynamic, the global, to establish the global dynamics of this quantum spin system on a graph, we need to prove the following proposition. So you start off with the nearest neighbor type of interaction, and by this I mean that phi x vanishes if x is not a simplex. And I assume that the supremum of this interaction energy over all finite x contained is finite. Then if you take any element A, fixed element A, belonging to A lambda naught, this is nothing but B H, H lambda naught, where lambda naught is fixed, then you can estimate this commutator with the Hamiltonian of the lambda region lambda of order n in terms of the, the size of A, the size of lambda naught, and this norm. Of course, this alpha is a reflection of the valency of the graph. In order to do that, the first realization is that the, these two statements, that the supremum of the energies and the supremum or the sum of these energies are equivalent. This is made pr primarily because phi x is finite range since it vanishes outside when x is not a simplex and all the simplices are of at most of order alpha. This al allows us to conclude that these two statements are equivalent. Given this and the fact that whenever a lambda one and lambda two commute, this is whenever a lambda one and lambda intersection two is empty, these two will commute, a lambda one and a lambda two will commute. This leads us to the following estimate. We write down h lambda a of order n and look at its norm. Now, this can be written as based on the definition of h lambda. We get, a, we get multiple sums. But what really happens here is because this commutator would vanish otherwise, we need to, we need to, we are automatically We end up with the summation where x1 needs to have a non-empty intersection with s0. s0 is nothing but lambda0. s1 is x, s, uh, s0 in union s1 and xj is xj union xj minus union x union lambda0. All this is on account of the fact that if you go sufficiently far, then phi xn and phi yn will vanish unless xn and yn are sufficiently close. In other words, they need to have a non-empty intersection. This estimate basically follows from Two facts. One is the interactions are finite range, and also the commutator vanishes when the sets are sufficiently far. So if this is not going to be zero, then we know that xi should be less than equal to alpha one because we, at the size of the simplices can be at most alpha plus one. That's the highest order of simplicity you can have, since the degree of the poly, the, uh, the, uh, age, uh, the valency of the graph is alpha. And hence, you cannot have more than alpha points incident with the given vertex. From there, we conclude that each of these excites can be at most of size alpha plus one. So this gives us an estimate for the size of these edges which are nothing but the union of xj, xj minus one, x one and lambda naught. So this is j times alpha plus one by alpha, the valency plus the size of lambda naught. This is going to be useful in estimating the size of the commutator order n, h lambda a. And on plugging this back, we get the following, okay? We have two raised to n times norm, sum sums over the products. Of course, this being non-empty, I can always fix a v1 here, and the V2, Vn here in general. And eventually, we arrive at this estimate that the norm, the size of this, the norm of H lambda A of order N is 2 raised to N times norm A, N times alpha 1 by alpha the valency plus the size of lambda naught, where we start, if we initially started off with the region lambda naught, A comes from lambda naught. And this norm, supremum of norm phi x summed over all x over V. 
this would allow us another important observation here is if you look at this commutator it would converge to this sum which though it looks appears to be an infinite sum it's however finite because is phi xi vanish if xi are not simplices and none of your simplices are order greater than alpha besides the commutator would be zero if these regions are not sufficiently close and hence this becomes independent of lambda for large sufficiently large lambda but the, at the same time the right hand side the finite sum of involving only finitely many combinations of phi xi and not infinitely many as the notation may seem to suggest how much time do i have um <laughs> not much you should essentially conclude okay so i just need time so from this i can conclude that this the uh, the global dynamics exists okay now let me go straight to the main result so when the global dynamics exists i can look at the limits of the gibbs states and look at the equilibrium state for me equilibrium state is nothing but the limit of a gibbs state okay the gibbs states as you know are given by tracy minus beta h lambda times a normalized by the appropriate factor now this state if you make the assumption this essential assumption that there exists a fixed v0 in v so the number of vertices which are at a distance exactly n from v0 is bounded independently of n and we can always define a metric to talk about this distance because v is connected and a distance is nothing but the shortest distance between two two vertices which is counted in terms of number of edges between them then if the above assumptions hold for one v not it holds for all v okay and this allows us to conclude that that there is a set of that there is a set of there is a sequence of of wns such that the surface energies are bounded independently of n and as you know when this is true and this in this wn is increasing set as you can see from the previous slide the wn one second these are your wns okay is a set of all v which have a distance less than you could end from v not in this form a, a sequence of increasing sets and the surface energies across these sets are bounded independent of n we conclude that the equilibrium state is unique for all choices of temperature beta thank you sorry i finished at in a hurry okay thank you <laughs> questions or comments So I have one, but um, concerning the, yes. the results on the time evolution, how does this compare with uh, Lee Robinson bounds and uh, uh, and its corollaries, in particular about uh, existence of dynamics for infinite uh, quantum spin systems? Well, well, as far as I know, I mean, I have uh, you, there are two approaches to dynamics. One is to directly prove the existence of dynamics by taking limits like this, and the other way is to to actually estimate the uh, to use the lee robinson bound to estimate the velocity uh, i really have not used that approach here because it was possible for me to directly compute and estimate the commutators and then show that the, uh, the global dynamics exists but lee robinson bounds are also obtained Absolutely, via yes. this this this, this uh, sort of uh, iterated commutators in fact i have in, i have used it in a situation where the uh, the the you know the commutativity did not hold like for example in the fermionic systems uh, it, the lee robinson bounds are extremely useful because this sort of approach might not work when you're dealing with fermions on the lattice okay uh, other comments okay if not let's thanks the speaker again and uh, all the speakers of this uh, session thank you Thanks to everybody on site and online for uh, for following the, this this session and uh, good night and see you tomorrow. <laughs>